Hello everyone and uh, welcome to Science That Stuff. Today I've got a very special guest with me. I've got Professor Mike Benton, who's a professor of vertebrate paleontology at the University of Bristol. And he looks at large scale uh, evolution of major groups like the dinosaurs, which you probably know about, and how mass extinctions and different environmental um, conditions affect different groups as well, like birds, reptiles, and mammals as well. Um, he's written over 400 academic research papers and written over 50 books, so please give them a read. And uh, so thank you for coming today, Professor. How are you doing? It's a pleasure. I'm very well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Awesome. So I'll kick this interview off with a lovely question. So what do you think are very real threats that we're experiencing today um, in terms of mass extinctions? or things that we'll experience in the very near future that we should be concerned with. Um, threats that were previously thought not to be as bad, but now are quite imminent. Yeah. I think that um, the current concerns are um, concerns that have been pointed out for quite a long time by environmentalists. Um, two of them are kind of natural world concerns that uh, geologists could comment on. Others, for example, pollution of plastics, microplastics in the ocean, these are new in a sense that people have really become aware of them. I can't comment on <clears throat> plastics, of course, in terms of what we've learned from the history of the earth and the history of life, um, because plastics are unique to, to human beings, but as if to add to the horrible things that we are doing, um, and, and the other one that we can't really comment on in terms of uh, geological history, I guess, is um, people pressure, just the sheer size of the population and, and the fact that humans are squeezing natural habitats on all sides and, and cutting down forests and doing stuff. But there are two big ones which uh, we're really focusing on, the world is focusing on, and those, the, the, the main one is carbon, Mm. Um, and that relates to two aspects that we can definitely uh, comment on in terms of the history of the earth. And the two consequences of um, excessive carbon, particularly carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, one consequence is warming uh, and the other consequence is acidification. And so I'll just, if I may say a couple of words about each and relate this to um, mass extinctions of the past, because as I say, we know the dinosaurs died out 66 million years ago. We know there was a huge mass extinction at the end of the Permian, 252 million years ago, as well as a number of others. None of those involved people pressure or human overpopulation or plastics, but they did variously involve excessive carbon dioxide and the consequences. So we know that these things can really happen. So as carbon dioxide levels go up, um, the climate inevitably gets warmer. It's because uh, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Yeah. And we know that from the present world, it's, it's very clear. Uh, and in fact, we now have the records, of course, carefully measured from many, many weather stations for 100, 150 years or more. Uh, and it, so that if anybody has any doubts, the, the data are there. Um, <clears throat> and then those kind of historical instrument-based recordings can be linked further back in time because of course human beings were not using uh, uh, high quality scientific instruments before maybe 1850. So, we don't have such uh, reliable records, but of course we have ice core records from the yeah. poles. We have uh, tree records, we have uh, dendro, dendro records or tree records. So people use the dendrochronology dating uh, uh, trees according to the tree rings and you can detect the conditions of winter and summer from the thickness of the rings in the tree, et cetera, et cetera. And so those connect back before those accurate human records. And I think most people accept that those are reliable and they, they confirm and highlight the fact that um, temperatures have gone up. So from the geological record, I, I can comment briefly on, on the biggest crisis of all time, which happened at the end of the Permian. Yeah. And at that time, of course, the excessive greenhouse gases didn't come from human 
sources. They didn't come from factories or cars or anything like that, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where the CO2 comes from. It, it will have the same effect in the atmosphere. Um, and what happened then was massive outgassing from volcanic eruptions, huge volcanic eruptions on a scale human beings cannot imagine, but such eruptions can happen on the earth from time to time. And the volume of carbon dioxide plus methane plus water vapor coming out of the volcanoes, all of these three being um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases with a tendency to reflect, a tendency to um, break up the ozone layer, attract heat into the Earth's atmosphere. And um, the, we know the effect because we can actually measure the temperature changes. And what happened at that time was there were temperature rises of as much as, much as 15 degrees centigrade. And that had a huge effect because if you imagine in tropical areas, the ocean temperature, the air temperature is maybe an average of 15 degrees to 30, uh, 25 to 30 degrees, 25 to 30 degrees. Um, and if you add 10 or 15 degrees, that brings it up to 40. And, and no plant or animal on land or in the sea can survive in those temperatures. And we often misunderstand that. We think, oh, you know, a hot shower is 40 degrees. And you think, oh, that's quite nice. But you try standing in that hot shower all day and the next day and the next day. And then you're not going to years. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's, it, people trivialize the temperature thing, but, but they shouldn't. Uh, and, and the two final points are, of course, that the, at the present time with the ice caps, we know they are melting. There is no doubt. And, and we know that sea levels are rising and, and we know that most large cities around the coasts of major countries around the world. So add it up, you know, it's kind of obvious. And the acidification, just very briefly, it is connected because it can be caused also by CO2, as well as other gases, sulfur dioxide and so yeah. on in the atmosphere, uh, mixing with water producing acids, sulfur dioxide in particular, plus water gives you sulfuric acids. So uh, and, and that kills plants. And we see that in pollution belts today, and that has happened in the past. And it can kill whole forests. And, and we don't want to do that because of course forests are protecting the earth. They, they, they regulate, it's not only that they produce oxygen, it's also that they regulate the climate. If you remove the forests, you, you end up with, in many cases, desert-like areas. The soil is washed away, yeah. you've got bare rock. Uh, and, and grim, grim conditions that nothing can, can live in. So it's a bit of a tale of doom and gloom, but I think the, 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 um, the concerns are obvious. And um, we're not, I suppose my final point here is we're not in a, in a vacuum here in, in, in the sense that we're just guessing. Oh, I don't know what will happen, we just guess. Yeah, we know what's going to happen. It's happening right now. Uh, and it happened big time in the, in, the, in the past. We can see the consequences. And I should say that rise in temperature of 15 degrees was associated with an extinction of more than 90% mm. of life. Yeah. Nine out of 10 of species died out. Yeah. I mean, you talked about uh, acidification and it's just really sad that people still today are not aware of the impacts of that. And especially on arguably some of the most important ecosystems on our planet, which are coral reefs. And if they go down, everything else goes down in the ocean as well, because it's so important to the entire ecosystem and yes. food chains and whatnot. So you're absolutely right. And, yeah. and we know that some, some creatures in the sea can maybe survive a certain amount of acidification, but the majority cannot. Um, because the corals, of course, they have a skeleton made of calcium carbonate, and that's very susceptible to the slightest of acidification. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the volcanoes that erupted on the uh, Permian-Triassic boundary, and those were the LIP, so the large igneous provinces. So what is the chance of one of those such as the Siberian traps or the Deccan traps from erupting in the near future? Hmm. Very interesting question. So you're absolutely right. Yes, these large igneous provinces are detected 
uh, in different parts of the world, and, and the one in Siberia in Russia that cor that corresponds in age to the Permian Triassic extinction. Um, the end Triassic extinction, there were similar kinds of volcanic um, uh, uh, large igneous province under the North Atlantic. Um, at the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous, the large igneous provinces in the Deccan part of India, a very large part of India. And there are a number of others and, and they're supposed to emerge. It's somewhat debated, but the general assumption or the general evidence is they emerge as land masses cross over hotspots and hotspots are places where the mantle of the earth, the molten inner part of the earth can, can just sort of peep through a, a, a thinner part of the crust. Um, yeah. I can't answer that though for sure. They don't, they, so they don't occur in a regular way. So it's not as if it's like every 20 million years or something. Uh, they do occur in many different places. So um, again, we can't point to a, a specific place and say, ah, this is the next one coming along. Uh, and I can't actually answer that. I'll bet you somebody could, and I'm sorry, I'm not that person. There will be somebody, there will be people looking at the positions of hotspots. We know where they are. There's one budding off the Hawaiian islands. There's another one uh, in the Indian Ocean under the Seychelles. And there are different places which have active volcanoes uh, active volcanic eruptions going on um, and, and there's one in North America beneath Yellowstone so there, there yeah. are different locations where so yes who knows we, we're, we're very despite the enormous efforts we're very bad at predicting volcanic eruptions and w even small ones uh, you know even if you live on a volcano <laughs> it's still difficult for to predict and people still get uh, uh, surprised by eruptions. But I don't know if anybody's pointing to uh, one of these enormous LIP, uh, LIP type events in the future. That's interesting. I mean, this planet is very unpredictable and does the weirdest things at the weirdest times. <laughs> All yeah. right. <laughs> so um, going back to the Devonian period, so there were two events that happened in the Devonian period that caused the um, great extinction of many beautiful taxa. So you have the um, Hangingenberg event, I think I pronounced that right, and the Kelwasa event as well. And I believe that ocean ox anoxia was pretty prominent in those two events. And that is the reason for all the death that was experienced. So what impact would that have had on the life that was transitioning onto land because as many people know that was the period when you had the early stem tetrapods like ichthyostega acanthostega moving onto land so what impact would the ocean anoxic event would have had on the um, tetrapods yes so that's it's a very good question and people have sort of forgotten the devonian mass extinctions quite a bit and it's worth reminding people they are on the same level, the same degree of seriousness as the end of the Cretaceous. And we remember that one because that was the end of the dinosaurs. But the, the late Devonian events saw the end of armored fishes. And if you were to go back to that time in the Devonian, in the shallow waters around the edges of continents and maybe lakes as well, rivers, there were all kinds of weird and wonderful fishes. Some of them you would have thought, yeah, that's probably a fish. But a whole lot of them were quite heavily armored. In other words, they, they had a kind of head shield. So it's like a, a shoe box or, or some other kind of box structure built of bone. And they were quite slow moving. But the biggest ones, like Dunkelostias, they were yeah. pretty scary. That thing was maybe seven, eight, nine meters in length with a, a meter long, a meter wide gape. And, and the jaws were. Um, pointed, the, the, there were not really teeth at the front of the jaws, there was kind of sharpened bone, and, and you can see the, the jaws where they come together, the, the edges of the bone are, are spiked, and they kind of cut across each other, and so this, this creature is like some enormous can opener, but, but this would be for opening like an army tank, um, and of course they were clearly capable of crunching anything, they, they snip you in half, no trouble, and they all went, so it's just that those amazing fish, the biggest animals that had ever lived up to that time. So the Devonian, I was just quickly checking, it lasts from 419 to 359 million years ago, so about 50 million years. So well before the dinosaurs, well before the Permian. 
Um, and, uh, but it was important in the history of life on Earth, which we care about because we live on land. And this was <clears throat> the time when not only were there all these amazing fish groups, which sadly mostly died out at the end of the Devonian, although then <clears throat> modern type fish has carried on. But on land, the story is really important because the first plants and animals went on to land just before the beginning of the Devonian. And all you would have seen at the beginning of the Devonian were just a few little plants, not much bigger than your fingers, just a no more than a meter from the edge of the water. So people often misunderstand this and think that as soon as life moved on to land in the history of the earth, it was everywhere, whoosh. No, absolutely not. These were nervous little plants. Well, you can't really be nervous if you're a plant, but they were keeping their connection into the water and, yeah. and they were not really making soil and, and developing to sort of land uh, ecosystems on land and there were little spidery insecty things and mites and such like living within the plants and and and, and then uh, uh, limbed vertebrates tetrapods moved on to land in the late uh, devonian but so those mass extinctions you mentioned the german names yes the 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 names <laughs> It's, it's sort of inconvenient for, for a general conversation, but there we yeah. are, the Hangenberg and the Kelwasser. <clears throat> They're named from localities in Germany where these things were first noted maybe a hundred years ago. And as you said, evidence of anoxia, the, the, and the clear evidence of that is the sediments are black. Now, let me, let me explain why black sediments means anoxia. Anoxia is absence of oxygen. And if the sediments are being deposited in, in on the floor of the sea and they have no oxygen, nothing can live because whatever creatures are living on the seabed, they need some kind of oxygen. The reason that it's black is that it's full of organic matter, which would normally be consumed by these creatures living on the seabed. So normally there will be worms and mollusks and other creatures uh, steaming around in the sand and hoovering up organic matter and so removing the, the carbon. But in the case of uh, these anoxic seabeds, and they happen at, at the time of many other extinction events, the, the sediment is black. This means the organic matter from plankton and other stuff is just falling to the seabed and it just sits there. There's nothing feeding on it, which is a very unnatural situation. And the reason that you get anoxia is, is generally uh, driven by the flash heating. So many of these events, just like the ones we've been talking about, are driven by flash heating, perhaps in many cases triggered by volcanic eruptions. And that may be true also at the end of the Devonian. And what happens is you get the heating of the surface waters. There may be some unnatural plankton algal bloom at the surface, yeah. which kind of uh, 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 sort of swamps out the water and, and removes uh, uh, oxygen from the deeper water and perturbs the normal kind of cycling of water where the deep water comes up to the surface, mixes, captures oxygen in a sense, and then because of its turbulence and then goes down again through these great cycles. And if you heat the water, you drive the thermocline down, yeah. and that stops the circulation and it stops oxygen. So yes, it, it first the German geologists thought, oh, this is interesting, you know, sort of black layer, lots of dead stuff, and then kind of nothing. What does it mean? They thought it was a local thing, but now we pretty much know it was a, it was a global event. Yeah, I mean, with the Devonian, I actually did my EPQ on predominantly placoderms and tetrapods. Oh, wow. okay, good. Yeah, so I wanted to try and see um, how we could use biomechanics to understand more about them. Uh, and things like that. But um, I think looking towards the future, if we also look back at the Devonian and see how the placoderms went extinct, how different taxa went extinct, and then if we apply that to the future, then I think that would be quite a sensible thing to do in the future um, of paleontology because people just think about the past in paleontology because it is to do the past, but I think also looking at the future is quite helpful to That's extrapolate right. where we could be going, where other species could be going. And whilst you can't really predict which uh, species are going to go extinct um, at this time and at that time, I think it's mm. quite useful yeah. to use modern techniques like that. Definitely, I agree. Okay, so um, 
talking about mass extinctions, how much more is there really to know about them? Because we know a lot as as a species, you yes. know a lot about yeah. how previous ones have died out. But what more is there? I think that the, the, the two big questions are to do with the, the physical Earth and life. And so there's a bunch of questions about the physical Earth, such as what happens in these crises in terms of um, sea level, uh, in terms of temperature, acidification, and all of those other kind of physical factors that maybe affect the uh, surface of the Earth. But then, of course, we always link that through to life because we think of the Earth as a habitable planet. So we're thinking about sea level, temperature, acidification and, and the other physical conditions, including, for example, the, the, the health of the soil. Mm. You know, people just disregard the obvious, the soil there. It seems to be everywhere. But of course, it's it's very tenuous. It's just sort of sitting on the rock. And we've seen in these past events, it can be removed. Uh, and then, of course, with life, you're quite right. We can't necessarily predict this species will go extinct next year or this one will go extinct um, in, in, in 100 years time. But I think we can um, determine risk factors. Okay. Uh, and some of them are common sense, like on the whole, bigger animals are more at risk than smaller animals. Yeah. And this is generally because larger animals tend to live in smaller population sizes, think of elephants or something. Um, and uh, whereas cockroaches live, you know, there are millions and millions and millions of cockroaches. Um, so size is one thing. It also relates to the availability of food, you know, the amount of food an elephant needs each day and the amount of area that an elephant or a herd of elephants have to wander over in, in the natural world is huge. Um, and, and much larger, you know, it's in proportion to size. So, and specialized diet is another risk factor. We think of the panda, we think of various other organisms which are doing fine in the normal situations. But of course, when humans put pressure on, uh, we, we then make them uh, less viable. So there are a few sort of obvious risk things. So large size, specialized diet, Thirdly, living in a very restricted area. So a lot of the species that humans have killed off, like the dodo and various Hawaiian honey creepers and, and moas, the giant uh, terrestrial birds in New Zealand, they were all killed off because they were living in very small geographic areas. So it's possible for humans or rats or cats just to kill every one of them. Whereas uh, species that live on a larger continental area, you, even if you tried, it would be quite difficult to kill them all. But linking that back to paleontology um, allows us a much broader sample of examples. And what we can look for then are what are the physical consequences of different kinds of um, crises. So we're very concerned about global temperatures. So we can actually say, okay, if you look at the geological record, we have a pretty large number of extinction events where uh, temperature rise was a key factor. So we can actually say, well, let's line them up. We, these are experimental cases. You know, so we can't run an, you know, if you take a simple view of science, you'd say, we do experiments in the laboratory. We take a test tube of this and a test tube of that. We mix them and we can predict the result and you always get the same result. Yeah. It's a little bit different for uh, these kinds of areas, because, of course, I don't think anybody would get ethical approval uh, to run a huge experiment on any part of the Earth to yeah. drive the temperature up or to try and kill species deliberately. This would be a kind of crazy pr proposal. Yeah. But we do, the Earth has gone through these, these events. And so I'd summarize by saying on the physical Earth side, the big, big area of growth for geology is homing in, homing in, closer and closer to get the detail out. You know, we want to know exactly. The temperature went up, yes, but by how much? We want to know actually how much. And then how does that correlate with volcanism or other physical changes? How, how, and, and how was the temperature and the climate distributed across the world? You know, these are kinds of things which until recently were quite difficult to reconstruct um, with confidence, but we're, we've got better equipment, better computing power, 
fantastic models, ways of estimating temperature from isotopic measurements in the rocks and such like. And then in terms of life, of course, we, we can try to um, quantify what are the consequences of, of different uh, uh, temperature rises, because we have so many uh, case studies from the past. There are maybe 20 or 30 different events. Some of them are mass extinctions, some of them are much smaller extinction events, but we, we can study all of those. So I think we can use these data to help to quantify and, and understand consequences right now and in the future. That's quite interesting. I mean, you did you talked about all the technology that we have available and how <clears throat> reliable that makes it. But the, the problem is, at, at the end of the day, it's just like the lack of fossil evidence that we have. It just slows things down quite a lot, which the data I mean, are not as good as they given. could be. Pardon? The data are not as good as they could be. But yeah. um, I think the, the feeling at the moment is they, they are really excellent for certain kinds of questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's only so much you can extrapolate. There's always going to be a, a margin of error, I guess. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So apart from what is already being done to combat climate change as we know it, um, such as sea level rising and um, acidification, as you mentioned earlier, is there any other element of climate change and global warming, etc.? Uh, or part of fighting a mass extinction that many people are not aware of, that the media doesn't cover enough? Hmm, that's a tricky one, because I think these these topics are getting discussed in a, in a better way now. So I think people are aware of questions of, cli uh, of, of changing weather patterns. We can see that happening, changing climates, uh, sea level rise, uh, pressure on different species, natural habitats. Um, I suppose uh, another area for humans to be concerned about, but this, this is a separate, well, connected and separate, but a big area that people are very concerned about is, is resources, because humans demand resources. And thinking about planning ahead, we have to take account of um, what we do and try to manage the amount of carbon that we produce. Um, and we have to think then about where we produce our food and how, what sort of food we eat, how far we transport it, all of those kinds of things and negative impacts of changing uh, uh, land use from, from tropical rainforests to cows. You know, we, all of those are much under discussion. I think resources as well, though, we need at the moment, of course, oil and coal are massively important resources, but they're connected with overproduction of carbon dioxide, this heavy pressure to remove those from the system. But people often forget that there are other resources we need if we expect to carry on having our mobile phones and, and our televisions and computers. They contain many rare elements uh, which yeah. are only extracted from the earth in certain limited localities. Um, and so already I think we're facing world shortages and geopolitical uh, maneuvering fights between different countries over who has control of this element or that element. And in future, it'll get worse because uh, for example, batteries need yeah. particular metallic elements and you, you can't just make a battery out of uh, uh, old tires and bits of wood, you actually need certain rare elements that are maybe only extracted in certain parts of the world. Um, so that's another connected issue is how we manage uh, food supply, food security and resources security as well, because all of those have intermingling risks in terms of climate change. Um, and I think most people are not going to be willing to uh, live, a, a, live a more sort of um, a traditional or farming type of existence and, and getting rid of not using electricity, not using computers. That would be one solution. We could give up all of these things. That's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> Pretty much impossible to do that. There would be no, this interview wouldn't exist if we took that approach. I mean, we could certainly try that, but um, I think it's I think it's Professor Christopher Ryan 
he argues that um, civilization is the end of us all and that it is the cause of everything bad that we are doing, such as the global warming, climate change, and mm. destroying other societies and um, disease and immunology relates to a lot of different things. His book is pretty good, to be honest. But um, <laughs> I think I strongly agree with that. The fact that some things that we adopt in civilization, some different mechanisms of coping with life, are just absurd because some of the tribes for example that we don't have contact with perhaps in the amazon or different localities around the world they don't have the things that we do like tv like electricity mobile phones and all these different ways of consuming content and so they are probably the best people for this planet because mm. the ecological mm. footprint is so low compared to all of us and mm. even if we don't mean harm, we're all going to cause harm somehow mm. to the planet. Right. So, I mean, I would love to be a subsistence farmer, but <laughs> I, I don't can't. think I don't think you would really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish we could. I would like to be, but and nobody it. can nobody can deny people from any part of the world the the right to have access to the fruits of civilization if if they wish to. Of course, it's very, it's very tempting, all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> all right, we've got one final question. So I read your paper on um, extinctions by hyperthermal events. And one of the quotes from there, I'll read, it says, during a rapid pulse of heating, an organism might survive for a short time, whereas longer term warming involves acclimatization and adaptation of physiological processes. So do you think that with the increase in industrial activity and the rate at which we are going um, every day, do you think there'll be sufficient time for us to adapt to all these changes um, mm. and all these different conditions? Or um, is it going to take a lot longer than that? Also, considering the fact that Darwin said that extinctions are gradual and they don't just happen like that. Yes, it's a very good question and quite difficult to answer. Um, so I think people often think that um, plants and animals, first of all, looking at sort of physiology and, and what we know about living plants and animals and how they cope, um, people often think that they're more adaptable than they are. People think of camels and various creatures that live in the desert and they think, oh, they'll be fine, they can live fine. But no, the, the camel needs water, clearly. It's not a miracle creature. Uh, it, it, all it can do is survive without drinking for two or three days, but my goodness, then it needs to drink like mad at the end of that. And all the experiments where people have observed um, the comfort zone of uh, plants and animals on land and in the sea suggest that the comfort zone is quite narrow. We all know the, that there are exceptions. There are some amazing microbes that can live at extremely high temperatures or very, very low temperatures, almost living in the ice, and others that can live in very acidic conditions. But those are just microbes. Uh, and, and plants, even cactuses, they, they have all kinds of means of shading and protecting because they are made of cells just like every other plant, and, and those cells can get burnt. In, if the sun is too hot. Um, so I think people sometimes think that, that nature, the, 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 there are enough species that will kind of survive, for example, high temperatures or, or lack of water, but the fact is no. And so what we're seeing in Africa at the moment, people in, in Northern Europe and parts of North America are maybe very sanguine about rising temperatures. They think, oh, this is quite nice, you know, we're getting, warmer summers, we don't get so much snow, maybe we can grow vines and make our own wine, how lovely. Um, but the consequence for Africa is, of course, the Sahara Desert is getting bigger every year, of course, obviously. And so we know that areas which within historical times produce rich crops on the north and south of the Sahara are no longer habitable. And in terms of the adaptation of life, just go there there is nothing living. Or you might find some miserable little beetle buried at depth under the sand. But the fact is, so that's, that's one thing. But as for humans, I guess, and the timing, yeah, you know, this is going on far too fast because the kind of, so my first point is that even if we can adapt, 
forgetting for the minute the, the rate of change, there is a severe limit on how far that can go. So there is almost no plant or animal on earth that is comfortable at 40 degrees, full stop. They can survive in desert areas that, where the temperature goes above 40. We know it does in parts of Africa, India, and so on, but they hide. They're not out there in the sun. They hide just like the people. And so they're not really living at 40 or 50 degrees. Um, and therefore, if you turn up the temperature, what happens is um, they flee, they remove themselves. They go north and south and get away. And you might think, well, how do the plants do that? Well, of course, they don't just sort of pull themselves up and move, but the seeds go flying out and they root. And, and so the, the distribution just moves and, and they will, the plants will not necessarily go extinct, but they'll over a few centuries, they may, the whole little cluster will move miles and miles north or south. Um, but this, yeah, the speed is important. I mean, clearly, if, if, if these changes are very rapid, then there's no time for plants and animals to move. Humans, of course, are different because we can, we can pack up our stuff and get in a car and drive away uh, and do that very quickly. Or we can uh, develop air conditioning and so that we can uh, enable ourselves to live in all kinds of weird and crazy conditions. We can bring in water. Uh, so that people can set up cities like I think Las Vegas is supposed to be pretty much in the middle of a desert, but yeah. you can go to the hotels and turn on your taps and run lavish showers and everything is fine. But of course that water is probably being pumped in for hundreds of miles at great expense. And um, so it's not, not a perfect solution. Yeah, so I, I don't think that if, if people were giving an argument to suggest, well, we can weather these temperature rises, they've happened in the geological past. Well, yeah, at one level, life recovers, but it typically takes half a million or a million years to recover after one of these heat crises. Uh, and we can't be sure that we would be one of those surviving species. It might be indeed cockroaches and spiders, they might be fine and, and might be able to come back, but humans might not be there. And of course we would have done uh, we can forget the case of humans and let's say, well, actually, we don't care. Um, but the number of other wonderful species that would be killed off would be quite large. So probably the easiest solution, which I think most thinking people have come to, is that it's better not to uh, keep raising the temperature, better to try and bring it into check if we can. And then we don't have to uh, run that really rather risky experiment of um, what will happen if we drive temperatures up five or 10 degrees? Um, I'd rather not know, you know, it'd be kind of nice to see if we can limit that rise um, rather than take all those risks. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing that people like uh, Bill Gates are trying to do with, um, I think he just uh, published a new book recently, right. um, How to Tackle a Climate Crisis, I believe. And the issues that he talks about and how to do it, it all seems very expensive. And it's all these things like green premiums that you have to pay just to make it more eco-friendly than it already is. And I think that's one thing that we as a species need to tackle because everything revolves around economics, annoyingly. So you got to try and fix the planet in an economic way and also in an ecological way and this mm -hmm. way. Mm. So it's a very and, multifaceted problem. And persuade it. people to come along with you. It, it, it's, it, so I suppose, yeah, it, it, Gates is, is helpful. I mean, there are many, many books uh, and, and it's really important that people understand the situation and, and uh, take it on board. But we need to think about this in terms of our own personal lives. Do we need to fly everywhere? Do we need to keep buying new stuff all the time? Or could we maybe go back to like we were a hundred years ago where you wear your clothes or use your household goods until they fall apart. Yeah. Because every time you go out buying new stuff, new clothes, new toys, new stuff, um, you're, you're using up resources that probably you don't need to. Yeah. Um, but Gates is, is helpful because he's a sort of futurist and there are many others. And um, what we haven't talked about and what I know nothing about would be the kind of technological fixes. And so we can pr probably achieve a lot of it by changing our lives and being aware of what we do a little bit more. 
And that's the easy message that David Attenborough and, and Greta Thunberg and lots of people are quite rightly saying. Uh, but coupled with maybe there are smarter ways of, of uh, uh, capturing energy to um, run our cities and, and stuff like that. And I think there will be a role for technology, but I wouldn't subscribe to the view that some might, that technology will solve everything. Um, yeah. We have to be responsible as well. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes quite a lot of sense because the change starts from here and here. So <laughs> you've got to have it within you to effect that change and to radiate out, that out to others as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so that is the end of this lovely interview. Thank you for your time, Professor Benton. And uh, thank you to everybody who's watched this. And I will probably be putting out more interviews in the future in the summer after these exams are over so uh, I hope you look forward to those and uh, yeah if you have any comments questions send an email put it in the comment box on uh, sciencethatstuff.com and uh, yes please do read Professor Benton's material it's pretty good I've had a look at it as well so it's amazing stuff um, so yeah thank you for joining everybody and thank you Professor Benton Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.